He's got to get going. Uh, I'm going to just jump the line a little bit and let, let Senator Barry come up and say a few words. Come on. In the 80s, the public schools had no money. Sal was the person who put education funding on the map. And the resistance was significant because there were many more conservatives in the legislature then that they happened to be Republican, not to cast dispersions on a party, but it was a tough, tough crew on education funding and on social issues. In those days, uh, there, was no fun there were no fundamental civil rights for folks who happened to be gay. And you could get evicted if your landlord discovered your sexual orientation, and people were evicted from their rental apartments. You could be fired if your employer didn't like your sexual orientation, and people were. The issues that we see playing out in red states in, today throughout this country were actually, to a surprising degree, problems for us in Massachusetts 35 or 40 years ago. It was a different place. And so when I visited, and I did yesterday and today, some of Sal's work, revisited some of Sal's work, I was struck by the environment in which he had to operate and how much he got done. Here's something from May of 1989, just a report. The full Senate has a range of proposals on its calendar this week, including rules changes proposed by Senator Michael Barrett of Cambridge and Senator Sal Albano of Somerville. Two of those motions would, have, would make it easier for the state Senate to bring bills out of committee for floor debate. That would make it more difficult to stall bills to death in committee, as has been the case for the past two years with controversial gay rights legislation. Sal and I and others were rules reformers because fundamental civil rights did not exist and didn't seem as if they ever would. We won that fight several years after the period I'm quoting to you now. Here's a, another excerpt from June of 1989. Just a small report on the sales tax proposal. Bay State businesses have a stake in an educated workforce and should pay a sales tax for some of the services they buy so as to funnel $200 million to local education programs, according to Senator Salvatore Albano. The Somerville Democrat has filed legislation extending the sales tax to the purchase of several services so as to fund public education. Here's one from March of 1990. Senate Chair Salvatore Albano earned the wrath of proponents of repeal of bilingual education. This was a movement very serious, almost succeeded to make it illegal to teach a kid in her own language, even if she had moved in to the state last week and only spoke her own language. But Senator and Senate Education Chair Sal Albrano earned the wrath of these proponents when he said bills to do away with the system of bilingual education would be based on, quote, prejudice and bigotry. Now, in those days, in 1990, the Massachusetts Association of School Committees was for the absolute repeal, the absolute prohibition of bilingual education. So the fellow opposed to Senator Albano said in this March 1990 committee hearing, mentioned to him that the general public was opposed to bilingual education. Now, the general public in 1990 may well have been proposed. Sal was ahead of his time. He didn't always agree with where the general public was going. He had a strong internal sense of justice and of fairness, and he was a kind, kind person. And that dictated his politics fundamental decency. And just to give you a sense again about the nasty politics Sal had to stare down, one more excerpt. This from April of 1990. Uh, a politician who's uh, still around in public life, not from Somerville, so I won't mention his name. But in that month, he touted legislation to reduce welfare benefits to families 
whose children are regularly absent from school. And to eliminate benefits altogether for children who drop out of school. So can you imagine there was a serious proposal put forward by a colleague of ours in the Senate in 1990 that would have cut off transitional assistance monies from families if one of the children dropped out of high school. That's how tough, that's red state politics in blue state Massachusetts circa 1990. Those are the kinds of battles that Sal fought and he was extraordinary at doing so. You know, uh, they talk uh, about uh, following in someone's footsteps in life or in politics. Sal didn't really follow in anyone's footsteps. Those were his feet. <laughs> Those were his steps. We follow in his footsteps. I'm proud to have been his friend, uh, lucky to have been his colleague, happy to be here thinking about Sal with you all today. Thank you. That was lovely. That was lovely. So my name is Michael Albano, and Sal Albano was and always will be my father. Uh, I have a lot of people to thank for what's happening here today, uh, starting with my mother. When my father actually died, we didn't do much. We did a couple hours at Doherty, and I think a lot of people didn't really get a chance to come and pay their respects as a result. So, and, and in part, that was driven by the idea that, you know, it was a kind of a tough time for our family and we weren't exactly operating on all cylinders. Um, we wanted to keep it quiet and small in, in deference in part to my mom, uh, but uh, with the idea that we would do this eventually. And uh, I looked at the calendar and I said, geez, he would have turned 88. I'm sorry, Julie. Was that you? Okay. I'm sorry. I stand corrected. I stand corrected. My sister Julie said, "What about March 11?" Uh, would, he would have been turning uh, 88 today. Uh, this would have been so happy birthday, Dad. Uh, uh, I wrote this down. Uh, why are we here at the Holiday Inn? <laughs> And that's, there's a little bit of a story there. I, I think everybody in my family worked here at one time or other. Um, this place opened, you know, when we were just little kids. And, you know, as some of you know, we grew up at the corner of Wheeler and Mount Vernon, which is like a block and a half from here. During the blizzard of 78, uh, they couldn't get people to come here to work because there was so much snow. And my father, well, we all came down here and worked during the blizzard of 78, but notably, my dad literally put an apron on and went in the kitchen and, and made omelets and, you know, and that's incredible. <laughs> I just, that just tickles me. <laughs> These days, it's hard to use the words honest politician, but if you look those words up in the dictionary, you will see a picture of Sal. <clears throat> uh, it did not matter the circumstance or whether it would be spelling, whether it would be good for his political career or not, he always spoke how he felt and not what you wanted to hear, which is usually fatal for a politician, but not Sal. He flourished both as an alderman and then as a state senator. I admired him so much. I even held a sign for him in his last campaign, even though at the time I was a staunch Republican. <laughs> I told him I thought he was going to win since nobody hit me with a tomato. <laughs> as an educator, he was second to none. He worked with special ed students. He had the perfect demeanor and patience. He truly cared for his students, and they knew it. The fact that he became a special ed advocate after retiring from teaching shows how much he cared for students uh, with special needs. My favorite story about Sal occurred during his grapefruit years. Apparently, my father, as I remember, uh, trying to lose weight. He was on a million diets. They never worked. Um, but uh, he, he started eating nothing but grapefruits or something. <laughs> Hence his grapefruit years. Uh, the faculty at Wilmington High School decided to have an Italian versus non-Italian <laughs> softball game. There you go. And uh, Tim says, I was the pitcher and decided to put powder on a grapefruit and pitch it to him. <laughs> and put it right over the plate. And Mighty Sal took a vicious cut 
The look on his face was precious as what he thought was a ball broke into many pieces. I think Sal thought that he'd hit the ball so hard he destroyed it. And when he realized what it was, he gave you his usual comment, Hill, you are such a That took to me. I like you. So that's my story. I was not surprised by the number of people I was told will be attending, will be attending Sal's memorial service. I'm only sorry to say I am not one of them as I'm in Florida for the winter, but rest assured, I will be thinking of Sal on Saturday. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Jake, Jake Griffin was, uh, loved my father, and my father loved him. They were just extremely close friends. Uh, Jay was there right till the end, and uh, unfortunately he couldn't be here today either because he lives in Florida. How many people live in Florida? <laughs> 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 see. Right. Some of you made it. That's good. That's good. Uh, but no, I, I got that. We got that a lot. You know, I can't. I'm in Florida. Um, I guess that's a place people go when they retire. Um, but uh, Jay was kind enough to send this little poem. Uh, and asked if we would read it to the room. Senator Sal, the liberal lion of the general court, equal rights for all he did support, champion of educational opportunities for all he led the charge when he got the call. His voice in the Senate was loud and clear. He spoke on any issue without fear. His family came first in all he did, loved his wife Gloria since he was a kid. <laughs> Julie, Michael, and Peter admired their dad, as did his seven grandchildren. So don't be sad. Sal fought the hard fight to the bitter end. I feel so blessed to have called him my friend. Whoa, I thought that was going to take forever. I've been <laughs> I came into the room and I looked at the program and it said first speak at Kenneth Lonigan and I went, okay, let's get ready for this. And I'm sitting there and sitting there, so I Gene Broom is sitting next to me and I went. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Kenneth Monaghan, and uh, <laughs> I'm very grateful for this honor um, to Gloria. I love her, and I love Julie, Michael, and Vito. So, how did I meet Sal Lam? I was 13 years old. I was about 4'2". <laughs> and uh, Glen Park. And there I was, and this enormous man came over to me because I was, I, I was very hyper. And uh, I don't know what I was doing, but he went, hey, you! What? Calm down. And you know, uh, we laughed about that for years, the, you know, the interaction. Um, but he was my rec leader. And then he shocked me. He said to me, I was, I think, 16 or 17, and he said, Ken? I said, yeah. He said, I would like you to be my assistant at the new teen center at the Elizabeth Peabody House. Oh. Well, hello. <laughs> of course. I had no idea what it would mean, but what a great leader he was. He took me under his wing, and I just did everything he told me to do. Um, quietly, too, because, you know, hello. So anyways, um, that was the beginning of so many wonderful experiences. What, what we used to do is we worked, you know, Monday through Friday, and on Friday night we would drive to Whitehorse Beach to be with Gloria and the kids. And those memories are just so heartwarming. I, 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 I can't say enough about them. But what really happened that I want to address here is uh, Sal Albano, Is, was responsible for my becoming a teacher. And I had 35 unbelievable years teaching. And how it happened was, Sal was teaching in special ed up in Wilmington. And um, he called me and he said, Kenneth, 
I said, what? He says, I'd like you to sub for me. And I said, sub what? <laughs> and, you know, and so up I go to Wilmington. I observed him for a day. And then I took over the class for a week. And it was such an empowering experience. At the time, I had dreams of Broadway and all of that. You know, well, nothing wrong with that. Uh, and I went into uh, the, the dean of students, and I said, I'd like to change my major. And she said, why? And I said, because I've been inspired. <laughs> And what I did is I changed my major to special education, and I had a 35-year career that um, my memories are so great. And, you know, what's so heartwarming is that so many of those young people are in my life today. They write to me. They call me. I love Facebook. <laughs> it's so easy. Oh, well, yeah, oh, hello, hello, how are you? Good. And, you know, um, so anyway, um, I, changed my, I changed my major to special education. And, uh, you know, one of the things that, see, when you spent time with Sal, if you got a chance, you witnessed his amazing ability to connect. Now, this class of his in Wilmington was special ed. They were challenged, and he was so gentle. But yet, when it came, he could put the, you know, and that's why I used to refer to him as the gentle giant, because that's what he was. He was a very sensitive, but boy, when he believed something, he was very, very clear about that, too. So anyway, there's only one funny story that I thought of that might, you know, resonate with you people. <laughs> Reference has been made to 51 Mount Vernon Street. And that was, well, in all the campaigns, that was kind of the headquarters. But for someone like myself that knew the family, it, you know, I was there a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and one night we were in the kitchen and Sal was cooking a five pound pot of pasta <laughs> and he's you know stirring it and doing all that now I was somewhat hyper <laughs> and I was flying around the kitchen blah, 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 you know and in the process of flying I hit the handle of the pot. And over the kitchen, I can still see it. You know the commercial on T on, on, with, with Bounty? Yeah. <laughs> Sal just went, no. <laughs> I was so frightened, I went, oh my God. And I took off and I ran through the pantry, into the dining room, into the living room, and he was so angry, <laughs> Un understandably. But that's, that's my funny story. Uh, my greatest uh, gratitude to Sal Albano is he gave me my career. He inspired me to believe that I could be a great special ed teacher. And what I loved is he instilled in me, without being, you know, really dogmatic, he instilled in me this love of those that aren't as fortunate as I am. And, you know, as I said, a 35-year career. Thank you, thank you, Sal. My career, which was wonderful, I retired in 2004, and um, I, I can't tell you how many times I thought of Sal and how he inspired me. And it wasn't, you know, like it wasn't a dogmatic, just very gentle. Like one, one time he was teaching in Wilmington and I'm observing, and he, he interacted with this little kid, and it, it was so touching, and it was what brought, I said, I want to be that for that kid. And Sal Albano, 
you were, and you, I hope we keep your, you know, um, energy, your spirit, your philosophy alive because you gave a lot and it was a life well lived. Thank you. Oh, I meant to say before bringing Kenneth up here that another thing uh, about his relationship with my father, my father didn't surround himself with yes men or women. He surrounded himself with people who came at him, came back at him. And, you know, I personally observed and witnessed a lot of these uh, contentious debates uh, that Michael Gentile spoke about um, in our kitchen. And Kenneth was there too, you know, and, and it got pretty heated, but he needed that. He needed to have other, other people in his life to give him other points of view, because um, he was very strong-headed. Let's, let's go with that. <laughs> uh, Gloria Moravi sat behind Salvatore Albano, an Italian class at Somerville High School. She wasn't very impressed with him, <laughs> because he was from East Somerville. <laughs> and belonged to a, a, a gang called the Dukes. <laughs> but he was the best dancer in the city. <laughs> that was the opening paragraph of a story I wrote about Sal for the for, uh, Boston Weekly newspaper, The Real Paper, in July of 1980, 43 years ago. <laughs> uh, nobody goes into journalism for the money. You go into it, you do it because you want to write, or you want to make the world a better place, or you want to make people feel, or you want to make yourself feel. If you're lucky, along the way, you meet people who, were, who will remain heroes for the rest of your life. Not many, of course, just a few. And you can't get too close to them because, well, you're eternals, and that's against the rules. In 1975, I joined this lady, Diane Parasic, then Diane Dion now, and Barbara Powers at the Somerville Journal, mm -hmm. and worked there for five years. During that time, I had the privilege of encountering an amazing number of heroes in this city. Some of them are in this room. One of, one of the heroes I met, of course, is the reason we're in this room. Sal Albano championed people who needed a champion. The immigrant, the addict, the laborer down on his luck, the father making minimum wage, the single mom trying to find a decent place to live for her kids. He fought for them even when it wasn't popular, especially when it wasn't popular. Because if he didn't stand up for them, who would? Sal probably lost more fights than he won, but they were good fights, and he knew it. And because he knew it, he could smile. And boy, could he smile. When Sal smiled, you just wanted to stand there and bask in it. His was a big, warm, innocent smile. Maybe I imagined it, but it seemed to me that he sometimes almost looked surprised by his own smile, as if he were suddenly remembering in that moment what was really important in life, and was thankful for it. I remember now and then someone re would refer to him as a, sal as a salt of the earth kind of guy. And well, the word sal in Spanish, sale in Italian, means salt. And the name Salvatore in Italian, of course, means savior. Indeed, for many people in this city, Sal was a savior. For me, as a young journalist, Sal made it possible to hold on to my belief that someone in public service could fight the good fight, hold firm to his principles, and smile as if he were truly glad to be here. I ended my real paper story with a quote from him. He said, quote, I've always been for the underdog. Being from Somerville, you have to be. <laughs> we're all underdogs in Somerville, <laughs> unquote. Here's to you, Sal and to the other dogs everywhere. Politicians who speak truth to power are rare. Sal might have been the OG of elected officials who spoke <clears throat> truth to power. And he did so at a time and in a context that was largely resistant to, to progressive values. 
He blazed a trail in local politics that continues to have impact in Somerville and well beyond. But in order to really understand how exceptional Sal was, you have to appreciate the rough and tumble environment of Somerville political life in the 1970s. It was intense. <laughs> Sitting at the press desk in the aldermanic chamber at City Hall, Bob and I had a bird's eye view of what some might call a rogues gallery of elected officials <laughs> who at times could have populated a network TV sitcom. <laughs> I won't name too many names, <clears throat> but most of Sal's fellow aldermen, not you, and they were all men at the time, were well to the center, if not to the extreme right of him. Sal didn't care. He never held back. I once asked him, off the record, how he found the fortitude to keep fighting a good fight, despite the predictable blowback from the peanut gallery. He looked me straight in the eye, and he said, you have to do what you know is right, no matter what, period. Easier said than done, but Sal consistently did just that, speaking out and speaking up to advocate for everything from rent control to feminist bookstores. He knew he was right, he had the courage of his convictions, and he didn't care if the Billy Joyce's and Frank Bakey's of the world disagreed, <laughs> which they usually did, publicly and loudly. <clears throat> in contrast to many local politicians in those years, Sal never came to the Somerville Journal News Office hoping to influence Bob, Barbara, and or me on a favorite political issue. He didn't have to. He trusted his moral compass. He knew we'd be fair, and that was enough. Sal Lovano enlarged the lives of many and helped make possible the more inclusive, diverse, and vibrant Somerville we know and love today. He was a big guy with a big smile and a big heart. Plus, he could cook. <laughs> rest in peace, Sal, rest in power, and keep on dancing. You know, when you get younger, you can, you can wing it. But when you get to my age, you can't wing it. You just have to beat some of it. <laughs> so this is my tribute to Senator Sal Obama. Ever think about destiny? How people can meet for one reason, and later in life be brought together again, not knowing when, where, or why. That's what happened with Sal and me. When Sal was about 14, and I was 19, Sal had a cousin. His name escapes me, but he owned a fruit and vegetable truck that he used to sell his produce at different locations, one of which was on the road to the Revere Airport. I can't remember how Sal's cousin found me, he might have been told to seek me out because when in high school, I worked after school at the Publix Market Produce Department in Davis Square. I was home from serving in the Army, going to school, and working part-time. Sal's cousin asked me to work for him on Saturdays during the summer. I told him thanks, but no thanks. I wanted my Saturdays free, but he just wouldn't take no for an answer. I finally gave in. And that's how I met this chubby young kid called Sal Obama that also lived in some of them. <clears throat> As it has so many times, things wrong with the corruption going on for so many years, much of it brought out in 1971 by the Globe Spotlight. The series was known for no bid contracts, corrupt elected officials, some almost going to jail, Property taxes higher than ever, covering their corruption. It was a breath of fresh air for all of us that cared, and were willing to fight to change it, and we did. Both Sal and I ran as reform candidates for all of them. Sal at large, and I ran in Ward 6, Davis Square. My fight was to help change the city, control corruption, bring back transparency, and give the city back to the people. Sal, on the other hand, wanted the same, but he also wanted to save not only the city, but the county, the state, <laughs> the country, and the world. <laughs> Sal and I had a great working relationship on the board, 
And we would always support each other, especially if either of us wanted to push a new initiative or go out, all out and gain support for a program. One coming to mind was the first halfway house for alcoholics to be in Somerville, known as Casper. Most aldermen were against it. They thought that their ward would be next. The neighbors didn't want it next door to them, and that made the ward aldermen also fighting to stop it. Even the state senator spoke against it. <clears throat> but that all, all of that didn't stop Salome. We both presented our case with facts. Happily, we got every alderman to vote yes. I joined the Casper board, as well as Sal's mother, Gloria, who became extremely active. End of story. Casper has been operating for several years without one problem. Again, Sal and I both felt it was the right thing to do. One thing I never forgot was that Sal was the very first elected official to endorse me from there. Sal was always fighting for the rights of union workers, rent control, welfare rights, teen centers, civic associations, and so much more, including all the great work he accomplished while he was the state senator. And I am sure you will hear more about his accomplishments by Senator Chairman. Our fellow alderman would kid Sal when he would bring forth to the board communications condemning others from outside the country for unfair tactics. One coming to mind was asking us to boycott eating lettuce. <laughs> because he was bullet some guy from I forget what country named Chavez. Rest assured that brought much fun and conversation <clears throat> around the horseshoe. I for one said, Mr. Alderman, you want me to start eating salads? I love salads. <clears throat> what are you gonna be doing again? Last month it was grapes, another time meat. What are you gonna be doing next month? Ice cream? You're better not. And Sal looked at me and just laughed. But you know, Sal could get away with doing all this because we all knew what Sal was most certainly a decent human being. He had the integrity of Martin Luther King, the morals of Abraham Lincoln, and the inspiration of Nelson Mandela. Only his political enemies would call him cantankerous. Sal once said to me in one of our many conversations, you know, I don't do all that I do expecting that the whole city should vote for me. But I was hurt when many renters asked for my support when main control was in trouble being, and, might, and might be being voted out. I like to think that I helped save it. And I found out later that many of the same renters did not take the time to go out and vote for me. I could sense the cell was let down by them. So I was also disappointed in 1984. He lost to Representative Pirro in the state senate primary by 200 plus votes. But if you recall, Pirro got indicted for accepting the bribe from an undercover FBA, FBI agent. And although Pirro was acquitted, Sal ran a brilliant sticker campaign, and after the recount, Sal was the winner. <laughs> I also remember one time an event that Sal and I attended with former Mr. Mayor L. Both Sal and I voted against an issue that the mayor sent to the Board of Alderman. The mayor was very disturbed at both of us and said to me, Mr. Alderman, can you tell me just what your commitment is to me? My answer to him was that I would always vote for any issue that you sent to the board that I felt was right for the city. But my commitment was to my city and the citizens in my ward. Sal immediately said, and that's also the way I feel, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> I had some wonderful times with Sal. I remember when the Sunville High School Ski Club had a trip to Chamonix, France. Joe Picatello asked if we would like to join us. I, along with Sal and Alderman Vinnie Champa, agreed to go. The trip was excellent, very reasonable, and the added pleasure was to ski where they recently had the Winter Olympics. 
Some brought their wives, and I enjoyed hanging out with all the ladies. Yeah. Kenny Lonergan's sister, Ada, <laughs> Nora Stacko, Barbeen Cabral, and others. My being more of a social skier, as well as the ladies, it would always be a late breakfast, a couple of runs down the slopes, and then a cold beer or a hot drink on the restaurant deck. Same ritual, after lunch, but all very enjoyable and a lot of laughs. In fact, Nora Stackpole's here today, and she said to me at the end of the trip, I was the queen in her Oreo cocoa. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Nora probably remembers that. At nighttime, we would either go downtown or just stay in and play games that we could all participate in, break it into two teams. I remember one game when each team had to give the answer within the time limit. While Sia's team was up to answer the question, Sal was in the bathroom. <laughs> he knew the answer. So he runs out of the bathroom, pulling up his fly zipper, which was halfway down, screaming the answer. You just really had to be there because it was so funny. No matter where you were with Sal, it just was never boring. Sal had the leadership to lead and not to follow. He had total transparency. You already knew where he stood on an issue. He could be as tough as a bear or as lovable as a puppy. Mm -hmm. You never had to worry about his integrity or his sincerity. Someone once said, a true leader has the confidence to stand alone, the courage to make tough decisions, and the compassion to listen to the needs of others. That's Sal Obama. I wanted to end my remarks with a poem. I looked at several, but none that I thought was right for sale. Then I realized the right one for, was the choice of the family made for their prayer card. So please allow me to read it to you once again. It's been said that history will judge a society by how it treats its young and old, its most vulnerable and less fortunate. A, least, a great society is one with quality education, health care for all, a roof over our heads, good job, protection of our environment, free and fair elections, and the promise of dignity for our older citizens in retirement. The American dream is the dream of the great society. This we all know, that it was also, without question, sales dream. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, that was love. that was beautiful. Thank you, Gene. Gene referenced the uh, 1984 campaign uh, that made Massachusetts history. Uh, no candidate for the United the Massachusetts Senate rather has ever been elected to the Massachusetts Senate as a writing candidate um, in a general election. I believe one person has won a primary, Jerry D'Amico. Yeah which we had as an example. We thought, oh, maybe we can do this, because Jerry did it. Um, but uh, I was, at that year, I was, uh, believe it or not, wasting my time on the Walter Mondale campaign, <laughs> which is where I met that gentleman back there, that's Doug Fleming, one of my best friends, and slept in that guy's bed. We kicked you out of your bed so I could have a place to sleep. But about, you know, not, not too long after I went to New Jersey to work for Walter Mondale, I realized that it was a lost cause and that my father was running for state senator and why the hell wasn't I in Boston helping, you know? And uh, so I left New York City. I left New Jersey and New York City in my apartment behind and moved back to Boston, moved into my parents' house. Um, and we lost the primary by 80 votes. And you know, running a writing campaign is definitely a radical thing to do, but uh, the, you know, my recollection is that during the, during the primary, Vinnie Pirro, the crook that he was, still running for the state senate was the story. 
that everybody was interested in. The Globe, the Herald. They couldn't stop talking about this folk hero. Matter of fact, uh, Mike Barnacle wrote an article that essentially turned Vinnie Hero into a folk hero. He made thousands of copies of it, <laughs> dropped it all over the district like a few days before the election. Yes, am I right about that? And that actually had a huge impact on the outcome, in my view. This idea that, yeah, maybe he's a little crooked. But crooked politicians get more done. You know, it's that sort of thing, right? And Vinnie had gotten jobs for everybody. He was, you know, a fixture in the legislature and a very powerful leader, and uh, he beat us in the primary. But uh, in the general election, our decision, despite my mother's protests, and I think she even threatened to divorce my father at some point, and she was right. I mean, it was a crazy thing to do. Um, but I was living in that house at the time, and it wasn't fun. <laughs> she came around. She always does. Um, on these crazy things my father wanted to do. You know, he's like, oh, we're going to do a writing. <laughs> what? <laughs> so, but uh, thankfully, you know, I had, I wasn't the only one who, who didn't think this was a completely crazy idea. There's a few people sitting in the front row over here who thought it was crazy, but they didn't think it was undoable. And one of those people was Alan Jalen, and one of those people was Frank Borges. So thank you guys for, uh, you know, giving that little extra push. And um, anyway, I think everybody knows the rest of that story, but uh, the, the Globe started publishing Vinnie's trial. The transcripts of Vinnie's trial were suddenly in the Boston Globe, and now everybody could see what a crook he was, <laughs> for real, and, and front and center. And that really changed things. Uh, dramatically, and that's when I think we decided, you know, if we're going to get this guy out of office or keep him from getting into office, now is the time to do it. Otherwise, we'll never get him out. And so let's take a shot at it. He was on the ballot, unopposed, by himself, and let's do this write-in thing, as crazy as it sounded. I also want to add, parenthetically, since, well, in part, as a way of saying thank you to Somerville Media Center, SMC, and to Cat Powers, is it? Yes. And to Joe Lynch, thank you, Joe, uh, for being here and, and figuring it out very last minute. And thank you. Sorry, I don't know your name. The camera guy in the back. Uh, very last minute, uh, a call was placed by Gene Broom, I believe, and asking the folks at Somerville Media to videotape today's proceedings. And they very quickly pulled it all together and got here today to do that. So thank you. But I. I DVD, if anybody's interested in having, watching this over again. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, once was done, right? Okay, but um, I mentioned that because one of the critical parts of the writing campaign was this moment when the transcripts of the Girls' trial had been published in the Globe, and a couple of guys named Erwin Hipsman and Charlie Tesh if I'm not mistaken, yeah. had the brilliant idea of uh, staging a reenactment of the Piro trial on Somerville Cable, which nobody watched. But how did we get them to watch it? I called the Herald and the Globe and told them that Somerville Cable was planning to do this and that they were going to air it the night before the election. It was beautiful. And of course, Vinny went eight and threatened to sue everybody and get an injunction, and that put more stories in the paper. And by that time, everybody knew about it. So everybody watched it. And we won by 2,000 votes. So, it was uh, probably the most exciting time of my life to be working with Brian and Alan and everybody who worked on that campaign. A lot of you are in this room. Thank you for that. But. Uh, with that, let me introduce Frank Borges. Oh, thank you, Michael. Oh, didn't realize we had this many people here. <laughs> Sitting so the you in the front row. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm going to kind of summarize some of that stuff with Michael was saying, uh, and talk about some of um, Sal's accomplishments in the Senate, and then a couple of highlight stories that I put together. First thing is, when I started doing this, I said to myself, 
This was 40 years ago. You know, it's like, wow, we were all a lot younger then. But anyways, when I think of Sal, two words come to mind. Persistence and integrity. And those were the two things that when I think about everything that we had to do, you know, he never gave up. Never gave up. Um, you know, starting in 1982, when we ran against a 24-year incumbent senator who was worthless. Um, and Sal was known in some of but certainly not very well known in Medford. And we had to put together a campaign. I honestly didn't really, hadn't even met Sal at that point uh, until the campaign started. And somehow I just got involved in a small part of it. Um, in, in Ward 5, and in any case, it was a tough campaign, and we knew it going in. We knew that uh, trying to beat a 24-year incumbent is not going to be easy. But in the end, yes, we lost, but by a couple of hundred votes, so it wasn't like we got slaughtered. Um, and it didn't hurt the next session that Sal became top vote getter for Alderman Lodge. So now all of a sudden, he's got a base, uh, he got known a little bit in Medford, and here we come to 1984. And as Michael said, you know, yes, we lost the, we lost the primary, and, but in the primary, we didn't have the issues of integrity versus corruption, because it was out there, but wasn't official. <laughs> Um, and I remember the day that we were over 51 Mount Vernon Street, and a few of us that were involved in the campaign met around the table, and Sal talked about his plan of what's the run the sticker campaign. And I remember Gloria was, you know, saying, he's just out of his mind. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know why anybody's even listening to him. And many of us felt like, might be out of his mind because this is not going to be possible. I mean, we couldn't win the campaign when we were on the ballot. Now we got to win it when we're not on the ballot. And Michael and I went to go re meet with the, uh, Senator Jerry D'Amico uh, to say, nobody's done a sticker campaign. How do you do it? And he was very, very informative. I mean, he gave us a lot of tips, a lot of hints. And as Michael said, he didn't win it in the, in the final to a sticker campaign, he got on the ballot in the primary by doing a sticker campaign. Very different than what we had to do. The other difficult part of it was some of them were method. Some of them had paper ballots, easy to take the sticker, and it says put sticker here, and just put it there. In method, they had those dreadful data cards, the punch system, and with the chads and all that kind of stuff. And the rule was, you don't put the sticker on the ballot, you put the sticker on the secrecy envelope. And in Memphis, people put them on everything. <laughs> Intent to the voter. <laughs> Intent to the voter, exactly. So in any case, you know, we went through that, that campaign, and I remember towards the end of it, with the final election, uh, and I'm sure Gloria will remember this, I mean, first of all, you gotta understand, it's very expensive. We already were $100,000 in the hole from the first campaign. And so we said, how are we going to do a campaign when we got to get stickers out to everybody and all this stuff? And Sal and Gloria, she was not in favor of it, but they went and remortgaged the house. Um, and it, it, I think it was actually in the middle of the night, uh, the Century Bank, we went to Marshall Sloan, and he said, come on down, get to the money. Um, so that got us going, you know. Um, but I remember towards the end of the campaign, where everything did get exciting. The stuff was in the newspaper. We had a, a headquarters in Davis Square um, at uh, H and R Block, and we had a basement, a dingy basement, that we had um, saw horses with plywood on top of it. And people would come down and dress envelopes and do other things. Well, the night that 
this thing hit it over cable TV and said to Gloria, we need people. We need people down there to make it look like everybody in the city is supporting us. And by the time the reporter came down, people couldn't even fit in the doorway. The whole basement was full, the upstairs were full, and all people were doing was put, doing the mailing stuff on it. You know, you think back in those days, it wasn't like automated where you could just throw it to a machine, right? People were handwriting, people were, it was, it was kind of the same. But the thing that amazed me was that, you know, even with all of that, we kind of felt like, we're not sure we can really get there. So as I was running the campaign as a volunteer, um, made the decision that we've already lost lots of money. And so I said, I don't think it makes sense for us to have a big party, especially if we lose, we're going to spend all that money and people are going to just be devastated. So election night, Gloria and I were the only two people in the headquarters, sitting on the floor of the headquarters while the votes were coming in. And people were calling us at the headquarters to say, here's the vote. And so we were talking about it. And actually, Gloria, for someone who was negative about it, she, before the votes even came in, she so said, you know, if Sal wins, you should go work for him at the state house. I said, where is this coming from? We just decided that we were going to lose. But in any case, the first results came in with the phone. I said, hold on, what did they say? Oh, what? And whatever priest it was, in Somerville, Sal had won. And then we started getting more calls and more calls. And, we, and it was just the two of us. We, nobody could get joy and jump. And it was just like, we're doing this. Um, and so it was a tough campaign. And the worst part was Medvedev, which, you know, wasn't very favorable to us at times. Um, you know, before we went into the final election, uh, Scott Hoshbarger was the uh, district attorney, and he gave us his home number, and he said, if anything's going wrong on election night, call me. So once some of was coming in, we realized we were working good numbers. Method was fumbling with cards, they didn't know how to do the stickers, they didn't know how to do anything. So we called Scott Hoshbarger, and by the end of the night, they stopped counting. There was a Somerville police officer at Method City Hall, a Method police officer, and a Middlesex County police officer standing over the ballots. It actually took them like three days to recount, start counting the ballots again. And even though we had won by 2,300 votes overall, the opponent then, of course, wanted to recount and try to see what dirty tricks they can do. But anyways, people, people who were there know that um, uh, as it went on. But again, here's Sal with his integrity, his persistence to move on. Um, we knew that we were going to be in trouble, even though we won. Because as we saw the quotes from Josh Backrock, you know, Sal was again persistent that we were going to have change in the Senate. Uh, and he, uh, the whole campaign was about how the Senate had to be more democratic. So, of course, then there was the thing that because our opponent was so corrupted into the leadership, he was trying to convince the Senate president to not seat Sal on inauguration day. So we really didn't even know whether Sal would be seated as a senator, because the Senate could just vote to say, no, we're not seating him. Uh, so it wasn't until inauguration day, we went up there, and he was seated, but was not treated very well. I mean, we had basically no office, no staff to speak of, uh, no supplies. It was just a matter of, stay, stay where you are, we don't want to talk to you. But again, Sal was very, very persistent. Um, and he, you know, we worked together. That's right. I think in the beginning, the only two staff people had in the office was myself. And where's Mary? Mary Alberti? Oh, she does. Oh, she does. Okay. So Mary Alberti, who was uh, just the two of us who were in staff. 
uh, where every other senator in the place had four, six, eight staff. They had uh, computers, they had uh, office budget, everybody had nothing. But we went along, we did our stuff, and a little funny story is they, the office that the previous senator had was one of the biggest offices in the state house. We got the smallest office in the state house. Two small, tiny offices on the fifth floor where nobody could find you. But the funny thing was, the fifth floor had a balcony. And if you open the window, you climb out on the balcony, and you'd be able to see in Boston. And we used to have a little grill up there, and we'd cook. <laughs> <laughs> and for those of you below us, the office right below us was the uh, treasurer of the Commonwealth, Bob Crane. And he used to, he was always trying to figure out, where is the smell of barbecue coming from? Is it one of the restaurants? Is it here? When he found out it was us, he wanted to know if we could send him a couple of burgers and hot dogs. So, it was, uh, it was quite an experience. Yeah. But what I'd like to do is, is now talk about um, some of the things that Sal uh, was able to accomplish. You know, uh, even as a junior senator, no committees, and he, again, persisted to push his will and get other senators to go along with him. You know, you ever go to the drugstore and you buy uh, prescription glasses for readers, you know, cheaters? Well, before Sal Alvaro, that wasn't allowed because optometrists had a big lobbyist and they stopped that from happening. So you had to go get your eye exam first, then you had to get the prescription, then you had to buy the glasses from them, the whole works. Well, we passed a law that cut them out of it and said, you know, you can get five dollar glasses. It's only just for reading, it's not so you can drive your car, or you can do this, you know. And now, every store you go into, you can get them for a couple of bucks, right? So that was a big accomplishment for him and for, and for, and for our, our, our people. The seatbelt law, Sal was chairman of the Public Safety Committee. It was very controversial at the time. I would say today, if we were trying to introduce it, people would say, of course, why wouldn't you do that? You know? But then it was very controversial. And trying to get it passed, and I, I remember <laughs> Boston Hello, because Sal was very stubborn as well. And we'd say to him, if you ever get a call from the newspaper, don't talk to them. <laughs> And of course, Boston Herald got him several times. You know, they would call him about the seatbelt law and they uh, kind of were ridiculing him. And what do they do? They take the quote that he says, which is, well, fine, if people want to smash their faces through the windshields of the car, then let them. <laughs> of course, that's the quote they put in there, so it makes him look like he's, you know, crazy. Um, no smoking in public buildings. Today, you wouldn't even think about it. Then, it was very controversial to the point where we had to get enough uh, senators to support it to get it out of committee because Bulger was just holding it in there, you know, and we got enough senators to say, no, it now has to be. So he was able to do that. Medford had, I don't know if anybody's ever seen it, but the Chevalier Auditorium, which was very historic, but dilapidated. And so Sal met with the mayor of Medford, and they talked about it. He said, what will it take to revive it? He said, well, we need money. And so Sal worked on it, and by the end of that session, he got a million dollars for the city of Medford, and now that place is flourishing. So, there is that. And also, you know, as I uh, was mentioning earlier about the uh, education reform, you know, as, as chairman of the uh, education committee, he was able to get a lot of reforms. But one of the things that also happened at that time, and Gene will remember it, we're now hearing about these train crashes with chemicals and all this stuff. Well, not too far from here, just down the street in Washington Street, there was an accident and it was a hazard, a hazard uh, spill. Firefighters arrived on the scene. 
Not knowing what the chemical was, their firefighter uniforms were melting. They were, they were overcome by fumes. Because they hadn't had the training, they didn't have special equipment. Um, so Sal, as chair of public safety, worked on a bill, and the HAZMAT bill, which gave training to firefighters, gave equipment. At that time, you know, you never saw really new fire engines. Also, these big green fire engines with all the equipment on them, uh, and the first one came to Somerville. And then they started spreading out across the state, so now everybody has the equipment so that these things don't happen. So those are some of his accomplishments. And then just a couple of stories, and then I'll be through. Um, as I was talking about the balcony on the fifth floor, you know, Salwood has real no cooks, you know. <laughs> He, uh, at times when he had to do something in the district and wasn't going to come to the office until uh, noontime or so, he'd call up and say, don't anybody buy lunch. And he'd make us a big pot of pasta bazoo. <laughs> and we would all sit outside the balcony, eat my pasta bazoo. <laughs> and the great thing was the way the balcony was set, you have two offices, the Senate office, staff office. The Senate office was always, nobody could see through it. So we, we were in those windows. When you work on the other side, <laughs> they could see right if anybody was standing there. So we made sure enough to do that. Um, and then, uh, I don't know, it's really enough I tell that, but, uh, but I will tell them about Gloria. You know, they always had their fights. And this was a good one. We were supposed to go to Caruso Diplomat for some sort of fundraiser. And we met at 51 Mount Vernon Street. It was going to be me, Sal, and Gloria. And so Sal comes down. OK, let's go. She said, you can't wear that shirt. It was a, kind of like a dingy blue short sleeve shirt that he was just going to throw a tie and a jacket over. And she said, no, you're not going like that. And he said, well, I am. So then we're back and forth. And she said to me, come on, let's go. You can stay home. <laughs> so we drove up there, and on our way up there, she said, you do know, five minutes after we get there, he'll walk in with a different shirt. <laughs> and I said, I don't think so, he's too stubborn. And sure enough, he comes in with a nice crisp shirt. And <laughs> so they always had their, uh, their ways. But, and then there's one last story that I've not been in. Uh, we always had constituents who were always looking for services or appointments or whatever. And there was a person in our campaign, some of you may know, Alba. Alba was a hairdresser. Mm -hmm. And the governor had an appointment for uh, somebody to be on that board. And so, I'm sure through Gloria's work and Sal's work, the governor agreed to appoint Alba. So we went up to the uh, state house to have her swearing in. <laughs> and her husband came in with a case of champagne. And we're doing it in the governor's outer office. We put the champagne down. And the governor, of course, busy. You know, every few minutes they say, there's gonna be a few more minutes, another few more minutes. Took a while <laughs> for him to come do it. In the meantime, her husband was so excited to get ready he took all the uh, wires off the bottles, the whole case, and it was so hot in there. So the governor came to a, a 12 gun salute. And the poor governor was like, I think he was going to get shot. You know? So, in, in, in closing, I just say, you know, what Sal had his, his uh, accomplishments. Uh, and his integrity and his persistence popped many corks <laughs> during his six years in the Senate. And I'm so grateful to be able to say that I worked for him. Uh, and I also want to, I think he's still there, Bill Bell. Wait, one more. I don't know if still there. Uh, but Bill Bell, he's, he's come to a lot of others. He was our legislative director as well. So we, we went to a lot of staff in the six years. And uh, it was all well worth it. So, thank you. Um, I wrote a lot of stuff down. 
I didn't say all of it, but uh, this is one thing I don't want to forget to say. Uh, and I wrote it down. Although our politics have become so frayed, it's downright depressing. Political discourse has been reduced to trading barbs and insults, not more than 280 characters at a time. I don't think I'll ever stop trying to get people elected. And I want to pay tribute to the legion of people who care enough about Somerville to follow my father into battle to hit the streets for leaflet drops and canvassing, to stuff envelopes, to hold signs at standouts and at the polls on election day, sometimes in the rain or freezing cold. Everybody who's ever run for public office has such admiration and appreciation for people who do that because they are the lifeblood of great political campaigns. And we ran a lot of them. Um, but uh, there's many of the people in this room, in fact, uh, and as I look around, uh, I have some really great memories of working with so many of you on so many campaigns, uh, and that comes rushing back to me today. I'm having a kind of an out-of-body experience today, seeing so many familiar faces and people that, you know, uh, were part of Albano, Albano campaigns and my childhood <laughs> and so on. Are, are done. I'm, I'm thinking now in particular of the final weekend of the writing campaign when an army of volunteers marching down both sides of every street. My dad walking briskly down the middle of the street. Does everybody remember that? Oh, yeah. we, we staged this like attack on the entire district over two days. Uh, and my dad, you know, if we get a voter at home, somebody rang the bell, if we get a voter at home, dad would rush up the stairs and talk to them for a little while. And you know, it was this, uh, it was, it was, it's something that I've tried to do in every other campaign I've ever worked on, but we've rarely been able to accomplish it. Uh, our dining room table at Mount Vernon Street, a lot of talk about Mount Vernon Street today, was used primarily for three things. If you happened to be at our house the night before Thanksgiving or Christmas, you'd find that table covered in ravioli. <laughs> so first of all, ravioli making. Uh, secondly, for eating, though in our house we mostly ate in the kitchen, but for Sunday dinner, holiday meals, we used the dining room. The third thing was uh, that table was for stuffing envelopes. And I can remember a lot of envelope stuffing parties. In fact, recently uh, we revived that. My aunt uh, Rosalie and Loretta Olson and my sister and my mother got together and stuffed all the envelopes for the invitations for this event today. So thank you for that. A lot of my relationship with Sal had to do with uh, uh, the election flyers because it's Oh, he said, huh? Yeah, they were. Yeah, that's okay. I think I remember them all. <laughs> for many years. Uh, I remember one um, that was Sal does his homework. I mean, the one thing about Sal was, you know, he was a very easy person to do flyers for because it was never about this is what I'm promising to do, right? This is my platform and all. No, it was always about what he had already done, and, right? And he had done stuff before he ever ran for office. When he ran for Senate, he had an incredible record as a public servant already. So it was really kind of easy. So one of, one of, one of my not most favorite flyers, but um, I don't, I'm not sure why I remember this one, but it was, so it was, a bunch of, uh, it was a bunch of books and he had done his homework. But then there was one that I did like, was what's Sal done for me lately? I took pictures of our uh, babysitter, uh, Mary Mahoney, um, in various sort of skeptical and angry faces, right? And so it was on the cover was Mary saying, what's Sal done for me lately? And so we would say, well, he did this thing about you know, rent control, and she would say, well, okay, but what's he done for me lately? And so then, I can't remember whether the chicken factory was in that one. Do people remember the chicken slaughterhouse? But so here he is, you know, rejecting investment. And it was like, you know, there were horrible jobs and it was gonna pollute the, the air in the entire area. And it's only because of Sal that it didn't happen. Um, so we went on and on about, you know, each thing. And then for each one, she had a great face. 
uh, you know, what's he done for me lately? And I can't remember how he ended it, whether she finally said, well, okay, <laughs> not sure. Um, then during his first, during his campaign against Dennis McKenna, I think it was, we needed to introduce him, sort of, because he wasn't as, as well, and certainly not as well known as Dennis McKenna. So I think that's the one that we did the story of a leader. Sal Obama, the story of a leader. So we used these sort of vintage photographs. There was Sal playing football. There was the wedding picture. There was Sal in the army. Um, the, the first one, which was up there before, was Sal's natal family, right? And he's a little kid in front of the neighborhood grocery store. Um, and then, of course, then there was, uh, uh, you know, the, center, the, the alderman from the neighborhoods and some of the things he had done. There was a letter he had gotten from um, a teacher who had sent him a letter saying, you know, he was so proud of him. As a, then I th another one, I think in the same campaign, was will the real Sal Albano stand up? <laughs> I th we had, so there were the two Sal's. Two pictures of two people. Well, it was the same person, right? Did that on one brochure? Yeah. On one side was the old-fashioned Sal. And he was, you know, he believed in neighborhoods and various, you know, traditional values and things he had done about those things. And then there was the new-fashioned Sal. And he was a teacher and he believed in innovation. And both of them believed in honest government, the old Sal and the new Sal. And of course, the real Sal, when he stood up, finally, because he was sitting in all of these, right? with different clothes. The real set, Sal, was both of them. During the um, sticker campaign, we ran really furious flyers. And you know, these were all distributed by hand. Right? We didn't have the money to do a district-wide mailing. Most of these mailings were much smaller. Dear friend cards and stuff, not, we didn't have that kind of money. And these were big flyers, they were all on newsprint. So one of them, one of them I remember was Michael's cover idea, which he just said, enough is enough. And inside it said, Vinnie Pirro has made Somerville famous. Famous for walking around money. Famous for gotta grease them guys. You know? We were basically saying, you can't talk to this guy because he's made an ass of your city. Um, and then the last flyer of that campaign was B. Allen's idea. I don't know how many people remember B. Allen. Um, she also drew it. I mean, she sort of designed it. Um, it was how to feel good on election day. And it was instructions. How to write in Sal's name, which was not easy. And you're talking about, you know, Many thousands of people who have lives, they do all kinds of stuff, and voting is a teeny tiny thing that they do occasionally. And they walk in and look at the ballot, and you know, it's pretty obvious. You stick an X next to the name, and that's it, right? They were gonna do something they had never done before and get it right the first time. A lot of people thought that they should put an X next to Vinnie Pirro and then put in his stick, Sal sticker underneath. Because they didn't see where you could put an X next to Sal Albano, because he wasn't there. It was, and then in Medford, it was that other nightmare. When fortunately, the city officials followed the law, which was, is the voter's intent clear? And if somebody had used Sal's sticker somewhere on that ballot, the voter's intent was pretty clear. Um, but I think the flyer that I most resonated with personally was when we did, I think, in the Dennis, yes, I'm sure it was in the Dennis McKenna campaign, because he had just been arrested for drunk driving. <laughs> and so our flyer was, the theme of that flyer was, I'm proud. And at the end it said, Sal Albano, a senator we can be proud of. And the reason I resonate with that, I think, is, you know, I'm a very ideological pe person, as, you know, people who know me know. Like, grew up in a left-wing, actually communist family, very committed. I was involved in fights on the left since 
high school. And of course, Sal was on the left, so that was great. But with him, there was a whole other dimension to it. I think every single person has said how, you know, he, like, he never stuck his finger out to, uh, to see which way the wind was blowing. Like, when he decided something was right, that was the only thing that mattered to him. He was like this, he had this sort of powerful, honest person. And he was really like, he was somebody you were always, you knew that you were going to be proud to be with him. That's what he meant to me. I'm in awe. I'm in awe of the people who've spoken. I'm in awe of all the people that came. This man meant so much to so many people. My parents started out by saying it was a nasty time. It was a nasty time in some of our politics. And it's a nasty time again in national politics. But it's not, well, it's not as bad in Somerville as it was. People don't generally call each other names, make frank, frank phone calls. And I want to just acknowledge that I think that a lot of the people here are people who were with Sal before he ran her office and that made it possible for people like Sal to be in office and stay in office and then make it possible for people like me to be in office. So I just want to, just out of curiosity, how many people here are for me severable and built that neighborhood? Oh, there's more than, okay, thank you. And how many people were part of the reform movement in Somerville that changed the city? And we're still here. Thank you. Lots of us knew first New Sale, not as a candidate or an author, but as a community activist. And I probably met him uh, when he was running, uh, he was working with other people in East Somerville on the new school to make sure it was a community school and was available to everybody. But he was involved in so many other things. Uh, and I'm going to talk about some of the issues because, well, I'm surprised. I didn't know I was going to be following all these people who told these great stories. But um, the reason I think people trusted him to start with is because we had been with him in fights. I think the people you trust are the people you've been on fighting in the foxhole with. Because you know their values, and you know they will stand up like Sal did and not give in. And Sal never gave up. I think everybody has word for that that they said today, persistent. His campaigns were hard. Um, he ran in, I do know, he ran for school committee twice, an alderman once, and Ward one before he decided to run at large and did win. If I had lost any of my campaigns, I probably would have quit. Because losing is hard. It is really hard because you look at people around you and you know a lot of those people weren't with you. Sal was a lot tougher. He ran against incumbents for representative and for senator and he lost before he came back and won. And of course, Lori was with him the whole way. Even if you were fighting, you were with him. And he could never have done it without her. He didn't give up an office either, and I want to talk about a couple of the not easy fights that he picked. He didn't pick easy fights. As an alderman, he was a leader in adopting and keeping rent control. And here we are again. He and his neighbors fought I-93 and lost. And then they fought the Interbelt and won. And like Gene, he fought for the Red Line through Davis Square. People who are now working in our city for better transit uh, for, and for less cars should know that they were preceded by people who did the tough fights. Uh, as a senator, he won some real victories, like the seatbelt law, frankly. We haven't finished the seatbelt law, but we haven't done primary enforcement. That is still not easy. 
Uh, and I was always mad after the 1993, uh, I talked about it, Ed Reform Law. But that's called Ed Reform. That's Ed Reform. And I always thought back to when Sal was there, he did two Ed Reforms. And the first one was the first time in Massachusetts that we made an attempt to bring every community to adequacy. And it was 75% of the state average, which obviously would have gone up. And they just didn't keep that promise. Because when times got tough, they didn't keep the promise. And things were cut. So, I, but the other, the other reform he did was to give grants to teachers and empower them to do innovation. He was a teacher and it showed, and the people who did the 93 law were not teachers and it showed. Some of the fights that Sal was involved in were so hard that we haven't won. He was the lead speak sponsor of a bill requiring just cause for eviction. Some of us are still working on that now. And for single payer health care. That'll be, I think I'm gonna leave that to my, he left me his bill for single payer health care when he left. He handed it to me and said, you can, you can use that for spare parts of this bill. I'm gonna hand it to my granddaughter's problem. There's a very serious opposition to that. But Somerville before Sal was not perceived as a liberal city. When I was first elected rep, they thought I was from Cambridge because I was like 21. I once asked, he didn't, and he didn't hide it. I think people have mentioned that. Uh, he didn't. So I'm going to tell you one story about a colleague who will be remain nameless when I went into this as rep. I was getting letters on both sides of some issues. I didn't know what to do because I don't like to tell people no, uh, unlike Sam. Uh, so, but I learned from a, another rep that one of my colleagues asked this other guy, what do you do when you get people on both sides? He said, I write the same letter. Mm -hmm. I agree with you to both sides of the people. So the person said, well, aren't they going to find out, be mad at you? He said, no. Nah. That's, if they are that smart, they wouldn't be voting for me. <laughs> so that was not so. <laughs> uh, he would tell you if he didn't agree with you. Uh, Alan said we were proud to support Sal, and I was proud that he was our senator. And by changing Somerville's politics and Somerville's image, even more than any policy, Sal and all of you who are part of that have made Somerville a city to be proud of. There's a lot left to do. I'm proud. I'm challenged. I think we all are to carry on Sal's work. I'm moved by today to do that more. <sighs> Not good at this. The night I won my Senate primary, we were at Anthony's. And before anything else, I asked Sal to join me on the stage. I said, Sal is my inspiration. He was, and he is. I can only aspire to be the kind of Senate who Sal was. Before retirement and during most of the rest of his life, my father never stopped moving. He had to be in five places at once. He was always working three jobs, chasing me around in hockey practice and games, coaching the Johnston Jets, <laughs> working in a restaurant. He never got a minute's rest for 60 years. In the end, it's possible he died of exhaustion. <laughs> he was just really tired from everything he had done in his life. Tired of carrying that huge body around. <laughs> Tired from living an extraordinary life, working four or five jobs, raising three kids, fighting a good fight, and then later tired of Trump. <laughs> tired of waiting for the Red Sox to get another World Series. <laughs> My father was 
many things. He was big and he was loud. I think you all got that. And ironically, one of the saddest things about watching the decline he experienced at the end of his life was he got progressively smaller and quieter. And I actually missed having him yell at me. <laughs> it's funny how that is at the end. For all the many attempts at dieting, his loss of size, the diminishing volume of his voice, uh, it, it actually, as I said, it made me miss him yelling at me. <coughs> Following in my father's political footsteps may have seemed like a logical path for me, but my, my father ruined politics for me. He set such a high standard of decency that he wasn't only a tough act for me to follow, it was impossible for anybody else I ever encountered to live up to it. And believe me, I looked hard, and for a long time, I've been working in and around politics behind the scenes professionally and otherwise for most of my life. And after dozens of campaigns, I have yet to encounter a politician or a candidate for office more honest, more decent, and above all, who had a greater sense of the true meaning of public service. He changed Somerville at first simply by being the honest guy in the room, and then ultimately by the sheer force of his will. As I sat there watching him cling to life, at the end I could think of nothing but what an extraordinary life he had, what an extraordinary life he gave me and to our family. The son of Italian immigrants, hardened by an abusive father, softened by the doting mother and four sisters who raised him, destined to defy the odds, become first in his family to finish college. And rather than leave East Somerville in search of a more traditional, more familiar American dream storyline, he stayed and simply changed the narrative from within his own neighborhood while raising a family, always working three or four jobs to make ends meet on a public school teacher's salary. My father was and he is what is exceptional about America and about his generation. He leaves behind a legacy of selflessness, of service to his country, to his community, a legacy of uncompromising leadership and the advancement of causes larger than himself, to which he devoted so much of his life. Somehow he managed to find the time to do all of those things, make us dinner most nights, never miss a single one of my high school hockey games, my brother's baseball games, my sister's performances, room hockey. Because above all, he was a husband and father. He introduced us to music and theater and sports and politics and history. He challenged us every night at the dinner table, not only to discuss the important burning issues of the time, but to finish everything on our plate, <laughs> for which we received a penny, then a nickel, or a dime, because I told him if he really believed in collective bargaining, he would give us a cost of living increase. <laughs> he taught me to hate Richard Nixon and love George McGovern and Fred Harris to live without iceberg lettuce and grapes. <laughs> he made our house a center of activity, which introduced us to so many remarkable people from so many different walks of life. Not bad for a kid from East Somerville. He gave us something, a higher calling to which we could aspire. He was a public servant in the classic sense. He epitomized the kind of idealism, compassion, and goodwill that has fueled our democracy for more than two centuries and which has become frighteningly more scarce in a nation ever more divided. He never stopped believing that you can fight City Hall, that one person could make a difference in people's lives, and that the Red Sox could win the World Series. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming.